today. And here we are. One week has gone by already since the last time we talked or we had this, this time together. And thank you for inviting me into your places, whether you're watching or listening or both. I appreciate you guys a lot. And I uh, just want to say on behalf of Redwater Alliance uh, Church, again, Happy New Year. We are still kind of new in the year. It's only the 14th. So, so good to be here with you. But anyways, today we're going to pick up where we left off at the end of November with our sermon series, The Path to Life. I don't know if you remember that. And by the way, you can find uh, the, that series on uh, Redwater Alliance YouTube uh, site uh, called uh, Psalm 119, The Path to Life. And you can also find it, maybe some of it on the Facebook, Redwater Alliance Facebook page as well. But, you know, this is a verse-by-verse -verse study of Psalm 119, so we're going to resume that. And of course, much has transpired since, since we finished at the end of November. You know, we entered that Advent season with all that anticipation and excitement as we prepared for the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Christmas Eve came, Christmas Day came, New Year's Day uh, arrived, and uh, today we are basking in the light of the wonder of God's redemptive purposes and plans, plans that were fulfilled in the incarnation of his son, Jesus Christ. So it's with these great blessings that we have from God that we now turn the pages of our Bibles to Psalm 119. And friends, if I know people, because I am one of those people, we will need to be reminded of a few of the features and distinctives concerning this, the longest psalm in the book of Psalms or as some call it, the Psalter. And my intent really is to make this pain-free as possible uh, for probably myself, because if you so choose, you could do your very own background study whenever you turn a page of the Word of God, wherever you turn it, and I would encourage you to do so. But this brings us to a really important question, why? Why study Psalm 119? Well, as a pastor, uh, one of the incentives uh, to study Psalm 119, verse by verse, is in part because as someone, as someone once said, quote, the scandal of biblical illiteracy, illiteracy is our problem. And that is a problem in the Christian world today, in the West here, and in particular in North America, is biblical illiteracy. Because as followers of Christ, our prayer and hope should be, as we make the effort to prayerfully read Psalm 119, to study it, to teach it, and to preach it, that our love for God's Word would grow and grow. Secondly, that our love for God's Word would uh, only be overshadowed by an ever-increasing love for God, who has given us His very Word here in these pages that we call the Bible. And thirdly, that we will grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but obviously also in the grace of Christ. So with this motivation and this intentionality in mind, Let's make a note of a few of the important features. Well, the first one that should stand out to us is that what we have in our hand is Hebrew poetry. Now, more could be said about that, but I'm going to give you the assignment to find out what kind of poetry is this. Well, it's Hebrew poetry, but it's a certain kind of Hebrew poetry. And you can find that out in any good study Bible or commentary that you may have or may not have. And you can find those online as well. But there are two prominent themes that come to the surface with Psalm 119. One, we hear we, in this uh, psalm, we find a theme of persecution and the affliction of the people of God. And two, uh, we find the all-sufficiency of the Word of God as well. And we see this demonstrated in a number of ways. And one in particular is the author's use of synonyms for the Word of God. And we will see this feature... Uh, clearly in our text that we will be looking at momentarily, as the author was sure to include a synonym, a synonym, not a synonym, a synonym for the Word of God in each of the verses that we will be looking at. That's a feature that you find throughout the whole psalm. Two quick final points. Psalm 119 affirms the character and sufficiency, as I said, of the Scripture. But last... And but not least, the text affirms that God's word is really a reflection of the nature and character of God himself. 
So please turn in your Bibles to uh, Psalm 119, and we'll be looking at verse 65 through to 72. These uh, sections of Psalm 119 are broken into eight verses, each beginning with one letter of the alphabet, of the Hebrew alphabet. Verse 65, you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart, I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. And the law of your mouth is better to me than a thousands of gold and silver pieces. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Our Lord and God, we just thank you for your word. And we just commit this time to you and ask by your spirit that you'd help us digest this, not only mentally and, and in our brains, but also in our hearts, that it would shape and mold us to become more and more like your son, Jesus. And may you be honored and glorified in this moment. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if I said to you, life is hard, would you be inclined to agree with me or disagree? Now I suspect, my gut feeling is that most, if not all of you, would agree that life at times can be hard. It doesn't matter who you are. It would be true to say that we've all experienced some kind of difficulty in our lives from time to time. To put it another way, our experiences in life, whatever they may be, reveal that tension and conflict are part and parcel of the world that we live in. So with this in mind, let's turn our attention to the text that we just read together. We want to look at that first verse, and here we see it begins with a positive God had been good toward the psalmist, and in response, the psalmist expresses his gratitude. And let's read verse 65 together. We read, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Now notice with me the phrase, You have dealt well with your servant. The NIV, I have the ESV, but the NIV translates the same passage as, Do good to your servant. So what's happening here is the ESV translators I translated the Hebrew noun tov as the word well, and the NIV used the word good. These are both good translations of the Hebrew. But the sense here is something that is good, that is pleasing, that is valuable, that is useful. God had done good to the psalmist. And you know, I just want to stop here for a second right off the bat here, very early into the message here, and ask you the question, have you experienced God doing good to you? Have you experienced God doing good to you? Now, don't answer that question too fast. Take your time and let the question simmer for a while. We'll be back at it shortly. Well, God had done good to the psalmist, and he'd done, he'd done good to the psalmist according to what? To God's word. Here we have the very first synonym in the psalm. Here, the psalmist used for the word of God is the word word. And you see every verse here has a synonym. Synonym, synonym. I'm going to mess up that word here. I'm sorry. If you went back to verse 49, and if you have your Bibles, you can go back there and read it while I mention something. Uh, the psalmist prayed there for the promises of God. And here in our text, we find that God answers prayer for the psalmist had received by faith what God had promised through his word. So God had dealt well. God had done good toward the psalmist. This was a normal experience of the psalmist. Put your faith and trust in the goodness of God, and despite the circumstances of life, God will do good for those who trust him. And this was a prayer, as we see, of another psalmist, who said, do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. We find that in Psalm 125, verse 4. Well, let's go back to the question that I asked you. Have you experienced God doing good to you? But let's go back even further to the very beginning. 
where we men ask the question, can life be hard? Now let me rephrase these two questions and put them into one. When life has been hard, have you experienced God doing good to you? Let me say that again. When life has been hard, have you experienced God doing good to you? You know, it's quite interesting, if you notice in life, that when life is good, when all is well with our lives, when we're firing on all eight cylinders, I would venture to say that many would say that God had been good to them. But yet when life is not good, when it's hard, when trials and tribulations come our way, and they do, I wonder if we would say that God is doing good to us. Do you notice I'm phrasing that? God is doing good to us. Because, friends, it's in the difficulties of life that Pastor Jason from Chicago once said, quote, we crave explanations. In other words, you and I yearn to find meaning when pain and tragedy are in our lives. Pastor Jason goes on to say that, quote, this inclination or this desire for meaning is part of what makes us, well, us. But here's another question. What if we can't find meaning in the pain? What if we can't find meaning in the pain? Well, often we turn inward, don't we? And attempt to come up with our own meaning. And Pastor Jason has something to say about that as well. Quote, if you're like me, your answer is often not a good one. Our bad answers cause us to respond to pain in ways that cause more pain to ourselves and even others. And quote, how true that is. And has this been your experience? Or maybe, just maybe, in your search for meaning, you actually question the goodness of God in your search and in your struggles. Well, back in our text, God had dealt well with his servant, we see this in verse 65. Notice then with me the psalmist's response to the goodness of God in his life. He prayed and he asked God, verse 66, teach me good judgment and knowledge for I believe in your commandments. For I believe in your commandments. We go to another person from the Old Testament. Maybe you've heard of him, King David. I hope you have. Well, King David came under the discipline of God for his adultery with the Bathsheba. And conspiring to and carrying out the murder of Bathsheba's husband. And then he cried out to God for forgiveness. And if we go to Psalm 51, it records for us one of David's prayers of confession. And it's in that prayer David reminds us what God desires of you and me what God desired of David. David said, Behold, you, that is God, you delight in truth and in truth. Pardon me. Let me repeat that. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Psalm 51, verse 6. This is the same idea that's happening here in verse 66. It's the same kind of prayer that our psalmist prayed here at verse 66. I don't know if you know anything about music, but for me, there's a melody playing in the background of our text here. And I wonder if you can hear it, because I can hear it. It's a melody of the gratitude to God. It's a melody of a blessed life, of one who put his faith and trust in God despite of the circumstances of his life who understood all too well that he was a sinner before a holy and just God, who sought forgiveness from God for his sin, who faced his persecutors, as we will see, by keeping the commandments of God, not running from them, who understood and experienced the goodness of God in his life, in the good times and in the bad times. Even when God disciplined him when he went astray, or when he was persecuted for, by others for his trust in God, he would say, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes, verse 71. So let me ask you again, when life has been hard, have you experienced the goodness of God? Or did you question God's goodness in your search for meaning? 
The psalmist praises the goodness of God in his life. He says here in verse 68, You are good and do good. So who is good and who does good? Well, you know the answer, God. This phrase, you are good and do good, points, as we mentioned, one of the features of this psalm to the very character and nature of God. And for this particular reason, it be, behooves us to spend a few moments unpacking the biblical doctrine of the goodness of God. We need to spend a few moments here. And I want to keep, uh, keep this time to very simple and concise for us. So I'll be uh, using uh, material from a biblical scholar by the name of Wayne Grudem. You may have heard him from his published works, Biblical Doctrine. And this will help us to keep it concise and just kind of get out the nuggets that we need. So when we consider the goodness of God, we are deliberating. We are discussing what is a moral attribute of God. More attributes such as God's love and his holiness, his righteousness, his jealousy, his wrath, and, and our subject, his goodness, which would include uh, his mercy and grace as well. And Grudem helps us by giving us a definition to work with. And this is the definition. Quote, the goodness of God means that God is the final standard of good and that all that God is and does is worthy of approval. So in a way... Good could be understood to mean worthy of approval. But this brings up a question, and Gruda mentions this in his, uh, in his book. Approval by whom? Are you and I, our humankind, able to decide what is worthy of approval? Well, Gruda would say no, and I would say no, but more importantly, Jesus would say no. We go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel, and there... The gospel writers record the interaction between the rich ruler and Jesus. You might have heard of that event. You'll find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So I'm using Luke's uh, sample. Uh, this uh, rich ruler goes to Jesus and asks him a question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit life? Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Jesus replied to this rich ruler, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Well, we can go back to the Psalms for additional confirmation of this, what Jesus said. For example, the psalmist in uh, Psalm 100, verse 5 said, For the Lord is good. The psalmist in uh, uh, Psalm 106, verse 1 said, Praise the Lord, or give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And the psalmist in Psalm 107, verse 1 Put it this way, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for steadfast love endures forever. So the question is, who is able to decide what is worthy or of approval? What is worthy of approval? Let me let Grudem answer that question. Quote, we understand the meaning of good as being that which God approves, because there is no higher standard of goodness than God's own character and his approval of whatever is consistent with that character. Remember, God does not uh, work outside of his own character. And moreover, and moreover, we can add this truth, that all that God does is worthy of approval. For example, as creator, God's goodness overflows in creation, doesn't it? We read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. The word of God also tells us that God is the source of all good in the world. James, in his letter, uh, put it this way, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. You find that in James chapter 1, verse 17. The Word of God also tells us that God does only good things for his children. The psalmist talks about this in Psalm 84.11. The psalmist said, No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. We even go to the letter of Hebrews. And there the, the writer suggests, no, the writer actually tells us that even God's discipline is a display of love, of his love, and it's for our own good. You find that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. 
And lastly, just one more item, as Christians, we should do the good that God approves. We should do the good that God approves thereby imitating the goodness of our Father who is in heaven. The Apostle Paul put it this way. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good for, to everyone, and especially to those who are the household of faith. That's in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. So in summation, God is the definition and source of all good, and God is the ultimate source that we as Christians seek. And just a quick aside, the reason that life can be hard at times is that you and I are sinners. Yes, my friends, we are. Sometimes we purposefully and sometimes accidentally make decisions that make our lives miserable and harder. But my friends, this doesn't change the goodness of God who through his son, Jesus Christ, and the work of what he'd done on the cross for us, pours out to us sinners his grace and mercy and forgiveness. The psalmist said of God, you are good and do good, verse 68. And God had dealt well with his servant, verse 65. God had done good to his servant. So friends, life is hard because of you and me, but sometimes, sometimes life is hard because of someone else. Let's take a look at verse 69 to 70. Why don't we read those together? The insolence smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. The word translated by the ESV, which I am using as insolent, 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 pardon me, can also be translated proud. But the original meaning can also be translated arrogant or presumption, presumptuous. The grammatical construct and the context seems to best suit insolent or proud, which really mean the same thing. Well, despite the humble and godly character, when we look at this text of the psalmist, there were those who were spiteful in their intent and promoted lies about the psalmist. Whether their own consciences were convicted because of the psalmist's godly character and his humility, we don't know. Yet persecution came his way with slanderous lies. My friends, life can be hard because of somebody else. We see this in the story of Job. Who called, whose so-called friends Job said about them were whitewashed with lies, Job 13.4. And of course, ultimately, we have the story of Jesus who was uh, arrested falsely, who was accused falsely, who was slandered, who was spat on, who was beaten, who was put on the cross who, with nails in his hands and his feet, who looked at the people around him and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 20, 34. Sometimes life is hard because of someone else. So the question really is, then, as we come to this point, how did the psalmist respond to the persecutor? Well, we see this in verse 69 and verse 70, where he said, But with my whole heart I kept your precepts. But I delight in your law. This is how he responded with all of who he was, with his emotion, his will, his whole heart, he dedicated his life to honor and obey the word of God. And you see, my friends, the contrast between this faithful, godly psalmist and his persecutors couldn't be more evident. For their hearts were, as the text tells us here, unfeeling as fat. This phrase used figuratively to indicate that their selfish pride had hardened their spiritual hearts they, their hearts were dull, they were selfish and insensitive. Life is hard because of someone else's sin. But as Pastor Jason so put, it, put it so well, quote, Jesus washes and cleanses us when the sins of others have harmed us. And he's getting that from John, 1 John verse 1. Uh, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. So let me ask you, let me ask you, when life is hard, because of someone else, how have you responded? Think about that. This brings us to the last two verses as we bring this to a close. And I just want us to notice uh, this phrase, it is good for me that I was afflicted, verse 71. Here the psalmist in his way and in a way repeats his thought from verse 67. 
The affliction that he had experienced under the guidance and wisdom from the word of God had done good in his life. God had dealt well with him. Well, my friends, then sometimes life is hard because, well, God is good. Someone once said, quote, when things get easy, the tendency is to stray from the path. Trouble sends one back to the word of God, end quote. My friends, this is what affliction and persecution did for the psalmist who said here in verse 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. By affliction and persecution, the psalmist had come to see the word of God worth more to him than a vast and great fortune, better than thousands of gold and silver pieces. I wonder, have you ever considered that God has purposely designed the world in a way that would take an effort on your part to become mature, to have sustainable change and progress in your life? Have you ever considered that, that uh, when life is hard, that we are shaped, that is when we are shaped and made to be more like Jesus? The Apostle Paul put it this way, for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians verse 4 and 11. Uh, chapter 4 and 11. My friends, sometimes life is hard because of you and me. Sometimes life is hard because of someone else. And sometimes life is hard because, well, God is good. So when life is hard, or has been hard, have you experienced God doing good to you? And my prayer for you is this, as we close, is that you would know that the mercy of God will never fail you, that you would know the goodness of God all the days of your lives, that you would know the faithfulness of God in your trials, and that you would delight in the word of God. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for the time here together. And I pray that we would ponder these questions, that we would seriously, seriously examine our own hearts, and that we would trust you uh, to shape and form us to become like your son Jesus through all of life's ups and downs and even in the good places as well. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for being with, allow me in your places, I should say, not with me. I'm with you. I'm far away from many of you probably. But anyways, God bless and shalom.